Hey guys, Brent Hall, Bill Cho. We're in Cook County, Texas. Gainesville, really north Texas. And we're gonna look at a window restoration job. So this is be a window restoration video on a commercial project. We're gonna talk about what works, what doesn't. Really informative. And we're gonna be looking at a great Texas courthouse. So this is the fourth courthouse there is here. There is a log cabin structure that apparently, according to lore, <laughs> was torn down by an angry bull. There is a one-story building. Uh, the first one, 1850s, log cabin, typical of Texas at that period. 18, uh, then there was a one-story. And in the 1880s, there was a uh, Victorian building that burnt down. And then this was built in 1910, 1911. Now, the deal about Texas is they had a bond program in the 1880s, and so many of the counties here actually uh, built great courthouses, great public buildings. In fact, they're a hallmark of their state. And so you have this incredible uh, catalog of historic buildings, uh, historic courthouses in our state. And this whole courthouse square is very typical of how these courthouses were set up in Texas. This was a gathering place. And many of these are still in, still in use today. Now, in fact, most of them are. In the 1990s, when I first got back to Texas from North Bennett Street, George Bush had enacted a program to restore the 100 oldest courthouses in the state. We've been involved in over 30 of those very proudly, and now Cook County is on that list. Now, this is a uh, classical revival style courthouse, okay? It's kind of funky, it's kind of cool. It bows are a little bit, but there's also some, uh, some other influences here. In fact, if you look at the columns, right, we've got ionic columns. For those of you who watch my classical series, there's your ionic column, and then you've got your brick entablature with stone cornice. See that? Now, if you look at the volutes on that on that uh, ionic column, right, they're kind of angular, okay? And we're gonna see a lot of angular details when we go inside. Notice the eagles on these outside corners, okay? And that cartouche, again, with the angles here. A lot of fun details. In fact, it reminds me of Louis Sullivan, and you're gonna see a little bit of that inside when we look at this detail. But this is a classical revival style, Beaux-Arts, I think is what they're calling it. Um, you see the tower and you see the, the effects and the stuff above. Really cool, great building. Let's go inside, we'll start looking at the windows. Okay, so we're inside this beautiful courthouse, right? You have this big light well that comes in from the top and this amazing stained glass uh, detail with the ornamentation there. Now, it's called a Beaux-Arts, okay? Because that's the school for Ecole de Beaux-Arts in France, okay? Where the architects trained. And so this Beaux-Arts style was a style of architecture they were trained in in France. Now, what's interesting though, is that even looking at this handrail here, you see how angular this balustrade is, right? And if you look at the uh, flower motifs up there and the plant motifs, they are very angular and sharp, right? And so you have some organic nature and organic movement here. So the, the, the style is, is kind of really cool. It's almost you have a Art Nouveau kind of feel working into this styling. Now, what makes that interesting is cool is it's not just a typical Beaux-Arts uh, courthouse. It actually has some stylization to it that, that makes it fun and unique. Now, enough about courthouses. We're here to talk about windows. And so what I want to do is we want to just look at these windows and kind of why they're failing and what's going on and how we can build better windows on these courthouses and on these commercial projects. So let's take a look. What's interesting is that these windows are actually well made. Okay, so you look at the joinery on this and this typical kind of finger type joinery here that joins the styles and the check rail are good. Okay, even looking at the construction of these windows, come here. Even looking at these windows, you're seeing uh, some good construction details, right? We've got the adjustable stop, right, with these screws here that allow this, this, shop, this stop to adjust. There are good details in this window that make it a good historic window. So, why are these? Why are we having trouble with these windows? Why are they failing? I think it's a, I think it's a combination of a number of things. Um, one is the paint color. It's a, it's painted a dark green. Okay. And whenever you paint exterior wood a dark color, it's very hard on the wood. It, the paint doesn't last as long. Um, the wood gets hotter. I've told you the story about the courthouse we shot with the gun where they painted the painted the uh, the 
doors dark purple and they were over 130 degrees in the summer months and sap was just coming out of these 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 uh, longleaf pine doors so dark colors across the board are a really hard thing to do to paint exterior woodwork that's number one two they didn't back prime okay and so we started back priming I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, but you'll see this board. Now this is the mull cover. This is going, this is the, the mull cover is what covers between the two windows. It's called a mull. And uh, this is the mull cover, but you can see that it's incredibly warped. I don't know if you see that, maybe an inch of warp. Now what's happening is that you can see the back side is not primed and the front side is. What that does is it creates equal, uh, unequilibrium, <laughs> a lack of equilibrium. There is a lack of equilibrium between the boards so that uh, one side will get, for instance, this side's getting very hot, right? And because it's sealed, if it gets wet, there's not, there, the, the two sides aren't the same. So what we have to do is we always back prime, and uh, meaning you prime the back side of the wood, um, our wood so that there's equilibrium, okay? So that the board will be less likely to warp. The other thing it does is it helps against rot. And you can see on this, this board up here at the top, by the way, we know this is a new board. Why? Because these nails, this, these are all shot in with a, uh, a new nail gun. But look at the rot in the end of this board, right? So this is the bottom and water is sucking up from the bottom, okay? And so, I mean, you can't feel it, but this board is really wet, okay? And so it has been, uh, you need also need to prime the, the end grain, okay? That's really where it's like a bunch of straws. It'll suck the water up to the end of the board. And because this is not long leaf pine, this is short leaf pine, it is, uh, it's rotting out. Okay, so it's the quality of the wood. It's a few of these other details that you wouldn't think they'd make that big a difference, but they really do. The second thing that's happening is, and this is the Brent Hull theory and, and school of thought, not anybody else's, but um, I know there's some guys out there that really love using insulated glass, okay? I think insulated glass is a waste of money. Um, in Texas, okay, uh, this piece of glass might have an R value of two, okay, um, because it's insulated, it's a 3 8 inch insulated piece of glass. Um, normal, just single pane glass will have an R value of one, okay? Well, even though you've doubled the R value, remember that these walls, solid masonry walls are probably R40, okay? so. You're not making a big enough change, and here's the problems that it causes. So, if this is a typical sash, if I if I cut a line through a typical sash, and we're looking at a at a sash right there, right? This is the the rail of a sash. Here's your profile. Okay, this is the inside. This is the outside. Right. Typically, that glass is held in with putty glazing. That's what we're redoing with the with our putty. Um, what they've done is they've come in, and they've got their sash. And instead of um, um, what they do is they actually mill into the wood this profile, okay? And then the insulated glass goes right here, okay? This is insulation, there's your glass. And you can see that when we look at the windows and we'll get that in B-roll. And then what they do is they put, in, they put an interior stop in here, okay? And then they nail that in. So now what's happened is your stop is on the inside and they've got this wood molded, uh, milled into the, the, the style and rail, this stop, meant to mimic this putty glaze, okay? So what happens though is that water hits this window and actually gets in behind this wood. And we are seeing wood that, we are hap that, that is rotting right here. And wood that's getting into this sash is happening right at that point, okay? This historic method, the reason why I'm kind of a purist about the putty glazing is we've been using it for 200 years and it works, okay? This is a great weather stop, weather stop and weather sealant. And in Texas, it makes no, it just doesn't make sense to use insulated glass. And so you end up with a window that A, the, uh, this glass will probably start to cloud in different places, okay? Because the insulated glass has a warranty of 10 to 20 years, okay? Well, we're in a 100-year-old, over 110-year-old building, right? We need products that are gonna last 50, 100 years, not products that are gonna last 10 years. And when you think about county budget and you think of these things and having to replace some of these glass when they get cloudy and you can't see through them anymore, 
And they get cloudy because the seal fails, right? That, that rubber gasket that goes around the outside fails. Air gets in there, it gets dirty, it gets cloudy. I'm sure you've seen that. So wood quality, okay, not back priming. Uh, painting it a dark color. Uh, this construction method, which uh, inhibits kind of some window, are all little things. It's like, it's like death by a thousand cuts. And so um, each one of those things helps, it, it contributes to the fact that these windows are failing. Now, these windows have been in here 15 years, uh, 16 years, something like that, and we're already coming back repairing them, okay? Now, when we are repairing them, we're repairing them with better wood, but it's kind of a Band-Aid, right? I don't know whether these last another 20 or 30 years, uh, exactly how long, but they will require a lot of maintenance and they will, will require um, just upkeep, right? That, if they had been built a different way with better wood, you wouldn't have that same cost. Okay, guys, so, Commercial window restoration project, right? Kind of some things we don't want to do. Painting it in dark colors, the wrong wood, uh, not back priming. All these little death by a thousand cut things that contribute ultimately to a maintenance issue and a, and a repair job in your future. So, not a huge difference between commercial and residential windows in, in the fact that in 1900 or 1920 when they were building this, um, you would have had a thicker window, you would have had a bigger sash with a commercial project, but it's still really the same type of window. So if you can restore a residential one, you can restore a commercial one, just a little more, a little higher quantity of numbers here. I'm Brent Hull, follow me on Instagram, Hull Millwork, Hull Homes, thanks for watching.